the issue is how fast can they swing while not either A, spraying it all over the place or having the fear of spraying it all over the place. Because sometimes that's what stops people is they think that it's going to be less accurate or cause more trouble. And that's why they don't do it. This is The Tournament Code. Thanks for joining us again, Mike. A little different than last time is we have Putt View Books, our sponsor. Their opening tee shot is what we like to call it. It's a little icebreaker. Help us to get ready and make things a little bit more conversational. And so this one is reasonably difficult, but uh, we'll see what you can do. At what course was Ben Hogan's first PGA Tour win? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I didn't want to. It's. A, I didn't want to give away too hard. It was. It was. It was at Pinehurst Number Two. Oh, okay. Uh, I didn't want to say. Oh, we give questions on theme because I would just give it away. But yeah, Pinehurst yeah, yeah. Number Two. He won the North South Open back when that was a PGA Tour event. So fun one for you there. As I said. There's been a lot while we were off camera. There's been a lot that's been going on with you since we talked. We thought it'd be good to get together. If people don't know about you, they can listen to our last episode. They can learn about uh, how you started Fit for Golf, how you got into golf yourself, how you went from a five handicap to a plus one handicap in essentially the span of a year. They can go check out all that stuff if they want to. Today, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper into some of the other topics that we want to talk about and maybe some things that we just briefly glossed over at that time. First, let's kind of just start with what you're doing right now with tour players. At that time, I think you maybe had one or two tour players that you could openly talk about. I think you were working with Seamus at the at the time, and that was the main one that I can recall. Now you're working with at least four guys on the PGA Tour that you know you can talk about and uh, who are having nice results and playing in. It's it's not not that it's bad to be on the fringe, but it's not just fringe guys. These are guys that are playing in elevated events, competing in the Memorial, competing at the U S open, putting up solid scores. And so it's a nice group of guys to work with. And you're still obviously working with a bunch of other pros. Tell us about in general, the pros that you're working with both at that level and at other levels in their career path. And just what that's been like. And we'll kind of dive in from there. Yeah, I can't remember exactly when our first episode was, but it was probably Seamus and Mackenzie Hughes that I was working with, I would say, because uh, Mackenzie was a couple of months before Seamus. I started with both of those guys four years ago, and I'm still working with both of them. Just over two years ago, I started with Steven Yeager. And then this season, I started with Ben Martin and Christian Bezadenhout. And then on the DP World Tour, I help or try to help at least Aaron Cockerell. He's a Canadian guy. He's um, he's not too far away from uh, having a run at getting one of the PGA Tour cards through the top 10 on the race to Dubai. He's about 20th, maybe 25th right now. So they're, they're the guys that I work with, basically. It's almost all remote. I did start going to slightly more tournaments this season, kind of because I had a couple of new guys and was just enjoying it and kind of wanted to do a bit more in person. But basically, uh, I think when people contact me, especially now, the main thing that they're trying to improve is their speed and distance. I guess that's like not not that I'm uh, crazy famous or anything, but I guess that's kind of what I've become known for, like in that circle, you know, is I'm interested in helping players increase their speed and distance. That's kind of what I, I guess, market and focus on a lot as well. So yeah, really, it's a case of in general, the players are following a training program through the Fit for Golf app. That's how I deliver the material to them. When I go and see them in person, we check up on what they're doing, making sure the technique is okay, helping them with weight selection, troubleshooting, you know, any issues they might have with scheduling, and just talking about how things are going in general. Like from 
from my point of view, there's there's basically two things that we try and stay on top of all the time. One of them is very objective. Like we're looking at their stats from PGA Tour events and seeing if they're going in the direction they want. So club head speed, ball speed, and distance are obviously all very closely related. You kind of can't have any without the other. And then the other one that is definitely related, but not quite as closely is strokes gained off the tee. Because if they're going up in speed and distance and strokes gained off the tee isn't improving or is getting worse, obviously then there kind of needs to be a little bit of a conversation then, well, is the program actually working? Like we've sort of achieved our goal in terms of speed and distance, but your scores might be getting worse. If It's rare that happens, uh, very rare. But um, that's something we do stay on top of. And then the other one is a little bit more subjective is how do you feel? Do you feel like you have enough energy to practice and play as much as you want? Do you have any aches and pains that are affecting either your swing or the amount you can practice and play? And they're really the two main things. If, if the player's speed is going in the right direction, if their strokes gained off the tee in particular is improving as a result of that, and if they're generally feeling good uh, physically, that's kind of my job done, I would say, to a certain extent. It's funny that you said you work with Ben Martin too. I'll, just before this, you were talking about how you work with Christian, and I know Johan is caddy. Luke Hopkins, Ben's caddy, lives two minutes down the road from me the other way, and I know him. So that's a that is a small world. When you said the players are getting all their programming through the Fit for Golf app, are you building custom programs in there for them? Are they running off of what you have, or are they running through? maybe a certain set of programs that you have in there and then you're modifying it. What does that look like? I am building them custom programs, but they're very, very similar to what's available like for the the general subscription. To be honest, the main reason that they're customized is because I know exactly what equipment is available on the PGA Tour trailer and essentially how training works in there in terms of the logistics with like how busy it can be. If you're using one piece of equipment at one time, you can't use another. And then the other thing is these players have a schedule that regular people don't in terms of their day job is practicing and playing golf, whereas the general subscriber isn't. And as a result of that, their their programming is a little bit different because they're you know, playing golf, basically playing and practicing six days a week, essentially, maybe seven days a week for a few weeks in a row. So it brings up a different, uh, I guess, like programming uh, problem to solve compared to the recreational golfer who's maybe playing or practicing, you know, one to three times a week. Because in general, the weekend golfer is gearing their practice and workouts around a Saturday or maybe Sunday game or both. They're not doing like Tuesday practice round, Wednesday practice round, four days of a tournament travel and then roll on to the next week. So the, the philosophy and stuff like that is the exact same. The customization is because I know exactly what their training facility is and they have a schedule that's a lot different to a recreational golfer, but it's not like there's special exercises, special programming style or anything like that. Like if if anyone who has used the app looks at their programs, they'd recognize and be familiar with everything. Specifically, how are the training programs different for each of the different players you work with? To be honest, there's way more similarities than there is differences. Probably the biggest differences, I would say, if there's a player... And this is where I think the coaching becomes important. Like is if for whatever reason there's a player doesn't particularly like certain exercises or they don't feel great, that's when uh, like variations will become more popular. Like for example, one of the players has a little bit of a like neck and shoulder issue. So he doesn't particularly like having heavy barbells across his shoulders. So he might be doing a like hex bar say squat or hex bar deadlift instead of a barbell back squat but they're going to be very similar training adaptations in terms of the lower body strength and power that we're trying to build like one of the other players he 
has like some some back pain that tends to flare up if he's playing three or four weeks in a row. So sometimes he doesn't like loading up uh, the hex bar too heavy because he's like, my back is sore from practice and play. It doesn't feel great trying to put 320 pounds on this. So we might do his like hinging or deadlift style movement with more of a unilateral exercise where he does so a single leg or split stance type deadlift where he doesn't need to hold anywhere near as much weight in his hands or load his spine anywhere near as much weight, but still get a good training effect for his glutes and hamstrings. So it's it's more small modifications like that rather than completely different, uh, I would say, like goals of the programming because I think pretty much all of them need to work on similar things in that with golfers because they haven't come through say a strength and conditioning like background in high school and college that you would get in other sports most of the time unless i've been training them for a few years they still have uh, i would say reasonably low-hanging fruit from improving just general strength general power and it's not like they've gotten to a point where you need to get ultra specific with the type of strength and power that they're working on which does happen if you've been training someone for five years or if they've been training for four years in college and four years in high school before that, then it might be a a different case. But kind of as you guys know, like kind of, I guess, uh, higher level strength and conditioning in golf is still reasonably new. So even though the player you might start working with is, you know, at the top tier of golf, their strength and conditioning background might be reasonably small. So you're teaching them things that would be, to be honest, reasonably like novice or, or moderate in terms of advancement in, in training level. That's cool that, you know, even now you're still seeing people like that. Do you think that's going to change more with maybe take for a lot of the younger guys that you're seeing in college or swinging in the one twenties, obviously on the high end, you have Gordon Sargent, but even I think, Carl Phillips is up there. I think who's the other guy from state? Michael Thor Bjornsson is up there. I think all those guys are probably pretty up there. Their programs probably, I assume by now, most of the top D1 programs have invested well in having golf fitness. Do you think that, do you think one, like the guys that are going to come out, you're going to see them, that low hanging fruit's going to be gone. Do you think there's going to be that much room for improvement in the same way there is taking an untrained person? Uh, and two, do you think for the guys coming out, obviously they're faster now. Do you think there's, are we closer to the cap of what they could be a, AKA or IE another, the guys come out are swinging at 125. And so the next group comes out at 135, or do you think we're getting closer and closer to the cap? Yeah. So definitely the guys that are starting to come out now are faster than they were before, just because as it's been popular for longer, that's filtering down to younger age groups. Like, for example, a, let's say a promising 14-year-old or 16-year-old now, I think the type of guidance they'll be given around both strength training and what their speeds should be is a lot different to what that advice might have been five years ago or definitely 10 plus years ago. So I think it's just natural that the development there is getting, you know, basically better and better. Not even, well, definitely better and better, but more so because it's a bigger focus like whereas before players who were at that age they didn't even know what ball speed or club head speed probably was or they definitely didn't know what the different like ranges were and what you should be trying to get to the training is definitely getting better in in colleges uh it's definitely getting better on the pga tour it's interesting like i'm in my fourth year of going to events now and each time I go out, I can definitely see that like there are definitely over the years, I can definitely see that the focus in the training sessions is is shifting a little bit, especially with some of the players. And there's definitely more trainers there. So you can see that there there is focus on it. I don't think that it will keep getting faster and faster because the same as anything, like the initial gains are easy. And I think you'll start getting to a point where it actually gets difficult to get faster and faster. Like, I think one of the reasons why we've seen or are seeing a kind of big increase is that 
like we used to think that one, say, 16, 17, 18 was fast, was a fast golf swing. And I don't, I don't mean to like say that it's not, but if you've had someone who's been focusing on it since they're 12 and they're an elite golfer, then it's not fast. If, if somebody who was already a pro and they were swinging at 113 and they're 33 years old, then getting to 118 will feel hard and it will feel fast. But if that same player had been encouraged to swing fast and strength train as a junior and through college, I don't think they'd think it's fast. Like I think, but, but obviously that's going to have a cutoff too, because most golfers fall into like reasonably the same realm in terms of physical capabilities in a, in a broad range. And it's not just going to be a case of we've people, if you tell them to focus on speed and strength, that they're all going to start swinging 130 plus. Like, cause that, that's pretty hard from a physical standpoint. But I do think that there's way more people will be over 120 and up towards like 125. Like, I don't think the physical capabilities required to average 122 or so are actually that high. If you've been focusing on it from a young age, if you've been coached well, if you're, you know, not super short in height, I don't think 120 plus, especially up to about 122, 123 is a crazy ask from a physical standpoint. But something like 135 plus, that's quite hard to do in terms of, I think, the type of athletic person you're starting to talk about is going to be much less frequent, you know. And then you probably run into the question marks of two, like, does it get to a point when that much speed actually makes golf harder? Which I don't know the answer to, but there is, a, I would say, a trade-off there where it's almost like a case of, like, one, I'm just kind of making up numbers now, but, like, 125 being great doesn't mean that 135 is way better, you know, and, like, Right now, like 125 is way better than 115 compared to how much better 135 is than 125, I think, you know? So yeah, I think, I think you, I think we'll keep seeing a big surge for a while. And as the tour starts to turn over, guys say dropping off and new guys coming out, I think that 120, 180 will start to get really, really common. It's already kind of become way way less of a big deal to see someone hitting 180 than it used to be um like for example the the average ball speed at the u.s open for players who made the cut this past weekend was 176 miles an hour like that would be unheard of a few years ago that would have been like a big hitter so i think it was like 117 or so club head speed whereas for a long time the tour average was like 113 and kind of like high 160s ball speed so yeah i think you'll start seeing a lot of 120 180 especially with the guys who are coming out but i don't expect to see a lot of 127 190 because that's hard yeah i remember when the track man averages were 115 and as a junior it was pretty easy pretty quickly as long as you had some sort of base level to get up to that speed pretty quickly and you get to one 18 119 without too much work too yeah especially Um, when you're not already you know an established player with a certain swing at that level like i've worked with a couple of tour players like going back a few years who were older they'd had some injuries they'd been you know playing on tour for a long time and they might have been like 112 or so and like it's it's quite a not that it can't be done but like Trying to get someone like that from 112 to say 118 is much different than trying to get a 16 year old that's at 112 to 122 by the time he's 24, you know? Yeah. And there's, there's also risk involved. Like some of it is, is uh, psychological. They're thinking like the discomfort of trying to change their game so much when they've already proven they can be really good with their current game. You know, there's, it's it's hard that way. When you're taking a play, when you're taking an old dog and trying to teach it new tricks in that regard, uh, is the 
first, th- so if we, probably, and you just t- tell me if this is fair, generally speaking, when we're working out for the most part, we're either building the base layer. So we're not doing swing specific things or like speed specific things. We're just getting stronger. So that's like, that's Bryson getting Jack doing exercise. Not all of them are sport specific or quote unquote sport specific or swing specific. They're just getting stronger because having stronger forearms is like not necessarily, not that that's the necessarily the key, but that's not a bad thing for you necessarily. All these having a stronger chest, having a stronger shoulder, having essentially a stronger body, generally speaking, gives you more room to produce force. And then we have speed training, which is taking that ability to produce force and getting it to uh, sync up together and, and essentially teaching yourself to go fast. If those are two fair two fair buckets to put them in, then with uh, when you're taking a player who's at like 112, been playing for a while, are you focused more on getting them to swing? faster that way or are you getting them focused more on because they're probably pretty untrained training them up and just getting them stronger and they'll probably pick up more just from that alone so they definitely are two fair buckets and that's the way i would generally look at things like get stronger and more explosive and practice speed training by swinging the only thing i would say is that practicing swinging as fast as you can is not just a case, like the the benefit is not just learning how to use the strength that you've built from getting stronger. Like there's also development physically from training as fast as you can. Like it's not just learning how to apply your strength. You're also making adaptations in your muscle tissue, in your tendons and in your nervous system that get you better at doing things quickly. Because like we can see that there is players gain an enormous amount of speed without getting stronger. They just go down the speed training route. Now, some of it is because there's big changes to mechanics for sure. But like if, if you're doing a reasonably high volume of high speed work, there's definitely adaptations occurring in the tissue, in the tendon, uh, in basically lot, basically all of our tissue. Um, and, and in the nervous system. So the, the brain and the transport of the signal from the brain to the muscles. When you're trying to teach the, the old dog new tricks, you can definitely, I would say that in general, there's bigger progress to be made from the speed training. But the problem you run into, and I completely understand it, is that That generally means, because if you get someone to start speed training, like they're going to start altering their swing to make it go faster, especially once they go to a certain point. Like you might get a couple of miles an hour by essentially trying harder. But then if you want to go up five miles an hour or seven miles an hour or more in club head speed, you start doing stuff that you see essentially like long drive competitors doing. Like you start, you start turning more you start uh, elevating up or in the backswing. You cock your wrists more. The swing gets way longer. And I think what tends to happen is players don't like that because they, in practice, they might start hitting some balls offline. They feel a bit uncomfortable with how it is. And they're like, that's not how I swing. So while I think that there's definitely more speed to be gained from the speed training type of stuff, there are certain players that are simply going to say, I don't like focusing on swinging as hard as I can and spraying it all over the place. I just don't like it. And it doesn't matter if I think that's a good idea or not at that point, because they're, they're the boss, like they're the player. You have to accept like what they think is best for them. And to be honest, they probably have a good idea because they're after getting to the level that they're at. And with those people, then I think it's really important to try and get as much as you can out of the physical development side of things, because they're going to be really happy if just from getting stronger and more explosive in the gym, they can swing without changing how they're thinking about swinging and being two, three, or four miles an hour faster, because that's a big gain at that level. Whereas if you have a player who's a bit more open to it and they're like, man, I started swinging faster and I really love doing the sessions, 
and I've noticed that I don't really hit it anymore offline. And they're kind of like, and to be honest, I don't really care. I'm just, I'm just practicing. I'll see how it works on the course. I think there's definitely more to be gained from that, but it is, it's, I would say it's less risky by trying to gain speed through getting stronger and more powerful in the gym versus trying to adjust your mechanics um, and trying to hit it harder on the course. Basically, I think, I think a good example of that, like, is if you look at Bryson, like he's changed his swing to gain speed, like more than anyone, like Bryson before he started the speed training stuff was like 118. Now I know he went completely more into it than most people would, but like, he averaged 132 for a PGA Tour season. Like, this absolutely nuts, that increase. But, like, he didn't do that solely through getting bigger and stronger, which a lot of people think he did. Like, the bigger change, I would say, was his golf swing. Like, he essentially started using a long drive swing while he was playing golf. And most players, there's just no way they're going to do that. And now most players would be happy with a five-mile-an-hour gain rather than 15 or whatever he gained you know but that's kind of looking at the extreme can be a good way to sort of break down what's available yeah speaking of bryson i was just thinking about watching him bang 190 plus ball speed all round yesterday and then watching rory bang 190 ball speed plus most of the time and it just made me think you know it's obvious why Bryson is able to swing it fast and hit it so freaking far. But it's honestly kind of confusing to me how Rory is able to do that because it just looks like a normal golf swing. Have you done much analyzation of that? Yeah. So like there, there's a couple of things. So I don't know the answer to this. Potentially Rory has like a physiological profile in terms of fiber type percentage, various elasticity measures and things like that. That mean for his size and strength, he's able to produce more force than most people who are of a similar build. Like you see that sometimes with guys throwing baseballs or sprinting. It's like, oh, he doesn't, he just looks normal until he throws or sprints or jumps and it's it's very different rory probably has some of that i think when rory's swing is broken down you can see that he does an incredible job with his mechanics and sequencing like the the turn the width how he get the timing of his mini squat and then launching you know with his legs i think is very impressive And then probably what's worth noticing as well is like Bryson arguably has another five or 10 miles an hour on top of what he was doing pretty easily if we wanted to, whereas I'd say Rory probably doesn't. Um, So you could say maybe Rory was closer to his 100% than Bryson was. That's that's kind of about as, as good as an answer I can give, I think, is like Rory might have some let's say physiological profile, like a, a, some advantages in terms of fiber typing. So like a very high percentage of, of very fast switch fibers that maybe gives him a huge benefit over most other people. We can tell from looking at his swing that based on his, I would say like swing length, he probably couldn't get much more speed. I think he does an unbelievable job with, you know, how he uses his body. And then the other thing is, I think even though Bryson is only maybe, I think he averaged about three miles an hour more club head speed. I think he's much below uh, his max than Rory is below his max. I think it's interesting. You mentioned sequencing right there. And that's something I've drawn more of an interest in. I had a buddy actually go to Dr. Kwan to actually go through a session like that. A friend of mine played uh, golf with me in college. And so we're talking about a reasonably good player here. And I was interested to see, you know, what 
what that was all about. And for people who don't know Dr. Kwan, Mike, I know you've studied some of his stuff. And so you can kind of tell us more about it. But the general gist of it is Dr. Kwan uh, is very knowledgeable in, I think, physics is his area, maybe biomechanics. And has great videos on you if you if you like know if you like playing good golf there's one thing if you like knowing the mechanisms why things work then you should watch this stuff unfortunately i'm i like playing good golf but i also really like knowing mechanisms uh and unfortunately i'm better at knowing mechanisms than i am at playing good golf so uh i've watched some of his stuff and understanding like ground force he has great videos on ground forces and how players are moving that would surprise you from stuff you've heard even recently from people like the concept there used to be concept out there of load and explode where people would go to their right hand side and explode up and the golf swing was like taking a med ball squatting down to your right and then throwing it up whereas i think mike you've shown some videos and it, practicing the the opposite which is the golf swing is more like swing a med ball up into your right and then throwing it down on the ground that's really uh closer to it but off my off my tangent there, Dr. Kwan does a great job with that kind of stuff. And one of his specialties as a coach, kind of, I guess is how you would phrase it, is getting people to sync what's better. So my buddy went in there. It's a two-hour session, and they essentially are wearing athletic clothes. They look like they're getting ready for the NFL uh, combine. And they hit golf, they hit golf balls, and they're just – taking a look to see where where their swing is. And they make a few like small mechanical changes, maybe. Most of it is about sequencing the swing. And my buddy picked up, I think, about three or four miles per hour. I'd have to go – have to. I'll text him and ask him about three to four miles per hour within a week or two of going there, learning how to, as Dr. Korn calls it, shurn better and time everything up better, uh, which to me is impressive and shows you that the proof is in the proof is in the pudding. Tell us a little bit about what you've learned going through some of Dr. Kwan's stuff, some about Dr. Kwan, whatever best you can re- recall as to his credentials. Cause I believe they're impressive from what I've read. And he's done a lot of research in this area and what you've learned on sequencing. Cause that, that alone, that revelation from our friend for me was shocking to say the least. Yeah. So Dr. Kwan is a golf biomechanist. He's based in, in Texas, is it is Denton the name of the university? Am I correct in that? Maybe I think it's I think it's Maybe. Denton. There's a lot of universities. Denton Women's but, University. Yeah. I think I should know, but I've actually been there for that same two hour analysis that your buddy did. So yeah, Dr. Kwan's expertise is in golf biomechanics. He has published lots of research papers on various things related to golf biomechanics. He's very interested in what's called ground reaction forces. So he has force plates and he has his own 3D system. So when he's measuring golfers, they are hitting while standing on what are called dual force plates, which means that you have a force plate under each foot. So you can see what's happening each foot independently. And you're wearing like little silver balls on various points of your body so that you can measure how they're moving through space. If you've ever seen like the behind the scenes recording for something like uh, the Tiger Woods EA Sports game, you know, you'd see some clips sometimes or even any uh, sports video game, you see the players in their reflective suits. So that that's what he does, basically. Like the word sequencing and actually similar with ground reaction forces, like they're definitely important. But as I've learned more about sequencing, I just consider sequencing under the umbrella of technique. I, I, I don't, I don't try to, and it, 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 like it is a term that gets used and I use it, but as I've, I guess, I don't know, learned more, or just, yeah, studied more, or whatever. I just, I just think of sec- sequencing as part of technique. It's not separate to your swing. Like it's, it's not a, it's not a, another thing. It's like, that's kind of like what your swing is. Like it's, it's how you're moving. What Dr. Kwan is very big on is that there is a, a general movement pattern. Not that everybody has to move the same because we know that that's not the case with elite performers in basically any sport, that there's a general type of movement pattern within 
certain parameters that are probably going to allow you generate the most club head speed relative to what you're capable of. And how he tries to do that is by encouraging people to learn essentially how to use their body in an efficient manner. Like one of his big sayings is that if the movement pattern is good, like high club head speed will be a byproduct. There shouldn't need to be, obviously, if you're trying to completely max out the club head speed, there needs to be a high effort. But his one of his big things is like that reasonably high club head speed and a reasonable level of control should be attainable without a huge amount of effort. And that most people have way more speed available by changing how they move rather than by trying to swing faster, if that makes sense. And he's developed like a series of drills that have become quite popular online where essentially he's coaching. Actually, what I really like is he has videos of him actually going through full coaching sessions with people too. But what, what he's, what he's really big on is using your legs. I would say shifting pressure and mass and using your legs to drive the swing as much as possible and allowing the body and hands react to that. So he has a lot of drills where it's it's rhythm based, where you're learning how to shift to the right and then fall back to the left, how and when to push with your feet. I don't want to try and explain it too much over audio because that's tough and I might do him a little bit of a disservice. But in general, I would say compared to what a, a lot of amateur golfers might think is quote unquote, like the correct way to swing a golf club. He encourages a lot more, I would say, movement side to side, potentially a lot more movement up and down compared to what most people would think of. You should just be staying stationary, turning and turning. Like there was, you know, you'd hear some people say like a golf swing is simple as like two turns and a swish. Like you turn back, you turn through and the club swishes, which isn't really how people are creating high forces. Like there's definitely, and sometimes when it's happening quickly, or if it's happening with really good timing, you probably can't even see it in real time when you're watching a player. But like, there's definitely more uh, lateral shifting, right and left, a bit more vertical movement up and down in conjunction with turning or rotating that most people would think to create high levels of speed. And kind of what you said there about your buddy who was a good golfer, like he's probably a plus competitive plus handicap competitive golfer or was if he played in college i'm sure to be perfectly honest like it doesn't surprise me that even someone of his level or honestly even a pga tour player can gain three to four miles an hour quickly the issue is or not the issue but like the the like harder question is can that player bring that movement pattern to the course and play golf with it like I promise you, you could get the vast majority of PGA Tour players either on the range, say, hey, bud, like your average club head speed is is 117. Let's see what you can get with these 10 balls. Like all of them will be able to get to the low 120s, like maybe even the mid 120s. But like the issue is how fast can they swing while not either A, spraying it all over the place or having the fear of spraying it all over the place. Because sometimes that's what stops people is they think that it's going to be less accurate or cause more trouble. And that's why they don't do it. But if you have a a coach like Dr. Kwan and you have high level players go to him, unless it's someone like Rory or Bryson, who's clearly, you know, coming towards the top of kind of what they're capable of, I guarantee most of the players he'd be able to say, well, if we got you to do, and that's that's the beauty of being able to measure it with the force plates in 3D, he'd be able to look at it and he'd be able to say, well, if we got you doing a little bit more of this in your swing, I'm sure we'd be able to gain some more speed. But it's what happens to the overall coordination by adding that in. It's like, okay, you went from 115 to 120, but the player is like, yeah, but there's no way. Like that feels so different to how I've been playing elite level golf for the last two decades. Like I'm not trying to, 
I'm not trying to ingrain, well, I don't really like the word ingrain, but I'm not trying to change my movement pattern to something very different to what I'm used to for three or four miles an hour. Like I'm 117th on the FedEx. Like if I drop outside 125, I lose my card, that kind of thing, you know? Whereas for amateur golfers, there's no real risk or downside. So I think it's much easier to work on that. But yeah, I think you'll see that a lot. Like the, and he, Dr. Kwan is too, uh, he has a like instructor course where you can go through his biomechanics course and in them, he he's measured a ton of torque players and he'll actually use them as examples and he'll show how a certain torque player like doesn't have, uh, let's say, who, who doesn't have a high club head speed relative to tour standards. He'll be able to show you why they don't have a high club head speed or what they could do differently. But he's smart enough to say, but look, like there's no guarantee. Like this, it's remember, it's a it's a theory course, you know. Like it's it's great for coaching, but you also need to remember, like we maybe like there's no guarantee this player would be better if we encourage them to move in what might be a better way on the graphs. Like that doesn't mean that it's going to benefit them when they're playing golf, as I think all golf coaches and golfers know. So yeah, that's that's kind of the the rundown on Doctor Kwan. I think. What was your experience? actually going through I forget what he calls those what he calls those sessions but they're on YouTube and you can watch them and they're pretty fun what was your experience going through it and did your swing change like did your swing change more not not change more but like was there was there a large alteration in how you were using the ground and what was the effect maybe on your swing yeah, so like I think the best thing about it, to be perfectly honest, was being able to get it quantified with the force plates and the 3D. I think like because, you know, I've probably had access to more high level coaches than most people have just from, you know, knowing them through social media and stuff like that. You know, I've been lucky enough to have a lot of people look at my swing and, and things like that. I would say like most of what he coached me on was things that I, you know, had been advised about before. And I probably, you know, knew were things I didn't do particularly well. But what was great with him is that he was able to show me to what extent with actual values. And then he can coach you on what he'd like you to change and then show you the values again after you've done that. But it kind of falls back into what I was just saying a second ago in terms of like, it really does depend on how much you're willing, I guess, to change and work on a new movement pattern. Because even though the movement pattern might be better in theory, it might be tougher hitting golf balls in the, in the immediate term because it's a new movement and you're uncoordinated. But I would say definitely I learned, I learned from him for sure. Like, like the big thing, that he changed for me a lot really was that like I tended to turn a little bit too much in my backswing. So too much twisting essentially and not enough shifting to the right with my pelvis and not enough extending up. And I was also quite rigid with my wrists. So I didn't have much wrist break and like from what I do for work and just one of my interests, like how I can create more club head speed is something I was interested in. So he talks a lot about an early shift of say the pelvis to the right and then an early recentering back to the left, which would encourage a little bit of a fall down. And that fall down loads the left leg or the lead leg almost like a mini, as if you were going to do a mini vertical jump and then you can push off it. So that's kind of what I was saying earlier in terms of like he he really tries to encourage you to get a combination of shift right and up as you start the backswing, then early shifting left and down while delaying the rotation, so not spinning out early. And then because you've had a little bit of shift left and down, your pelvis has dropped a little bit and you've flex your lead knee a little bit and then you can push off that almost as like a mini vertical jump move which helps speed the club head up um one of the lines he has in his course and it kind of stuck with me a little bit but it sounds obvious is like 
for golfers or coaches interested in club head speed, there's really two big areas that he likes to focus on. And he was like, one is how the golfer's feet interact with the ground. Because if you're trying to change how much you're shifting, that's going to be done by pushing with with your feet, essentially. And then the other one was how the golfer's hands and wrists interact with the grip. And that kind of stuck with me in terms of if I'm practicing and I'm I'm trying to gain speed, I'm generally thinking of how I'm shifting my body and what I'm doing with my wrists. And yeah, that's that's something I've, I found pretty helpful. I want to go back to something you said previously, which I thought was interesting, and it's that you know, increasing some, particularly a, an older PJ Tour player's club head speed, just a few miles an hour may not be the best thing for their game. Did you, being someone that's new to golf, did you always have this opinion? And if not, how did you come to this opinion? And also, do you think that there are players slash fitness slash swing coaches out there on tour that think differently than you and say any speed is going to be positive no matter what? Well, like to kind of clarify there, I definitely think gaining speed would be beneficial for them. The, the issue is that what they need to do to gain speed, they, they might not be comfortable with. And there's no guarantee that the pursuit of gaining the speed will benefit them. Like if you could, if you could keep their game the same, but have them 15 yards closer to the hole on, on every, on every hole, like that is going to help. But I think the, the kind of question you run into is if, if that player is just not comfortable doing what you think is required to gain the speed then it's probably going to be tough i was pretty i would say conservative when i started working with tour players in terms of being very cautious like not to try and uh i guess push my opinions too much because you want to make sure that basically you're just doing what the player wants you to do that you're not you know, trying to garner too much control over how they prepare to play golf. Probably gotten a little bit more comfortable over the years if players have asked questions or kind of bringing up the conversation. Like now I definitely like talk to players about and suggest to them how important the stuff outside of the gym is. Like, if if they are willing to do speed training or if if like they not that I'd be the one coaching them on it but you can generally tell by looking at their at their swings if you think there is room for them to gain a lot of speed by an adjustment in technique and that might be a discussion with their coach or just asking them what they think and asking them if they want to try something but um in regards to the question do other coaches uh like have differing opinions to me it's actually interesting like the last couple of seasons anytime i talk to a player or a coach or a caddy what you'll hear all the time is they're like man i played a practice round with ludwig yesterday or we got paired with rory last week or whoever insert name of long hitter and they're like I don't know how you compete with that guy week in, week out. Like th- they would all talk about just how big a deal it is because they'll tell you how hard a certain hole is, but so-and-so is flying it over the corner and it's it's completely changing the golf course. Like I, I was at the event, I think, I think the PGA this year was the week after Quail Hollow. Um, and I went to the PGA and just talking to, uh, caddies and coaches and players when you're hanging around and you remember it was Xander and Rory separated in Quail Hollow they were like of course they did like they they were they're obviously like they're both really good but they were also both smashing it like Rory averaged something like 188 and Xander was like 186 or something and they were just like on certain holes that difference was just crazy you know so I think it's rare you'd, you'd find a, a coach or player or caddy now that's like that thinks the speed stuff is overrated basically interesting i think 
We've talked a lot about speed, uh, and I think that's something as we've talked about, we might talk about again more sometime. I wanted to hit two other topics that I'd hope to hit today, and then we can head to wrap. The first is just Fit for Golf 2.0. Tell us about, we're familiar with Fit for Golf app. You've upgraded it. Uh, you've upgraded the UX UI, I think. Tell And you've upgraded some of the programming. So tell us what's been going on with that. Yeah, so... I started the Fit for Golf in 2017 and from then until this year, I was essentially paying a subscription to a software company that was designed for personal trainers that would allow me to use their platform to host my app as such. But it wasn't really my app. It was just I could upload my logos, my videos and make it look like it was mine. But there was... I don't know, tens of thousands of other trainers, whether they're personal trainers or, you know, strength and conditioning coaches uh, could use the same service. And that was great because it made the setup really easy. Like there's already an app there built, ready to go. And they're a huge company with a lot of people working on it. The problem is that I had zero control over the features or the user interface. I, I couldn't change anything because it was all locked to how they wanted to have it for everyone. So over time, that became pretty limiting because there was ways I wanted the app to work that I couldn't make it. So last year, I hired a development company to build a new app completely from scratch based on the feedback I'd gotten from six years of using the company that were hosting the original app. Uh, I also re-recorded the whole video library and rewrote the whole program library. And that app, which I call Fit for Golf 2.0, just to make it clear, it was the second iteration uh, released in the last couple of months on Android and Apple. And at the moment, kind of transferring all the subscribers that were on the old one over to the new one. And any new people that sign up, the only one you can sign up to is the new one. I think like the probably one of the, I would say, biggest improvements in my opinion is that I think it's much based on the way I rewrote the program library. I think it's much easier for a user to find and select the appropriate program for them, whether they're working out at home or in the gym and kind of what their current goals are and what time of the season they're at. That's basically how I try to make the programs is whether you work out at home or in the gym, there are separate programs for you. Then there's some alterations on the programs, whether you're in the middle of winter, somewhere where it's snowing and you can train as hard as you want, or if it's the middle of summer and you're playing in tournaments. Um, And then there's also some based on, your experience level. So if you're brand new to workouts or if you're an advanced trainee and that's basically it. It's just a monthly or annual subscription to access the app. Um, Yeah. And I kind of think it's a simple way for golfers to have the, the way I try to lay it out is it's really easy to follow a year long periodized training plan where you have programs for each stage of basically the year slash season and, and, and work through it basically. When it comes to the programming, what, what is the, what are the options look like? And what if I'm someone listening here saying, yeah, I'd like to get better at golf, but, and be more golf fit, but I also don't want to look like Justin Thomas, like have his body physique or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, I also want to look a little, I want to look, uh, not jacked, but I want to look pretty, I want to look pretty good. And I'm not saying, and that's not necessarily what yours doesn't necessarily make people look like Justin Thomas. So tell us about how the different types of programs that are on there and how, uh, people can structure that and also work that in with any speed training they're doing. Yeah. So the thing that people are prompted to when they open the app is there's a program matcher feature where you answer a couple of multiple choice questions and then the app will recommend the most suitable program for you. Like kind of anyone who knows my programming and I guess more importantly, people who don't, most of it is quite general in nature in terms of like, yes, it is geared towards people who 
want to get better at golf. But from my point of view, that's largely done by improving general physiological capabilities. So there's going to be a lot of work on things like strength and things like hypertrophy, which is gaining muscle size, uh, which people who do, let's say, more traditional lifting programs would be familiar with. If it's someone who is interested in, let's say, traditional gym goals, like improving on certain lifts and improving their body composition, like there are also things that I'm very interested in. And essentially, like the way I've made the new programs is like they are programs that I would like to and am following myself. And I think where a lot of people kind of are the limitations from more traditional, say, bodybuilding or powerlifting style programs that people use in the gym, it can just be challenging to get the right amount of volume at the right times of year based on how much you're practicing and playing. And also they tend to miss out on some smaller pieces that can make a big difference. Like for example, doing a dynamic warm up that's making sure you're working on things like hip mobility, thoracic spine mobility, uh, shoulder mobility, neck mobility, a little bit of more explosive power work in different planes and things like that. But then also do your general lifting stuff to get bigger and stronger and more explosive. Like that's still a foundational aspect of it. Perfect. Uh, I think, I think I'm going to switch over. I'm not going to take my shirt off on camera right now. I'm not fat, but I have just been stuck. I don't know if some people hypothesize that, <laughs> uh, it's for, maybe I should just take my shirt off on camera. Maybe that'll get us views. <laughs> um, but I don't, I do it all the time anyway. So here's a, here's a great look if you're on YouTube. Sorry, Irish Mike. Oh, um, <laughs> but you see, like, I got like, it's not like my body fat percentage is that is not like super high, but like I always have this right here. You need to get back on fat. Don't fly. <laughs> <laughs> There's this program I did. This really great program by Paul favorites. Who we've talked about fat. Don't fly. But the funniest part about it, I did it, I did it when I was in law school and there's like lots of other things going on and nutrition was not something I was paying that much attention to. So I did fat, don't fly. And I told Cooper about it and over like a 12 weeks fan, I got fatter. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I know my norm. I would say if I'm healthy, like my healthy, good weight, what I consider a good weight, depending on what I'm doing in life is somewhere between 200 and 210. And I think I probably went from like 205 to two. Maybe he was higher. Maybe I went from 210 to 215 or something like that. And I thought, huh, I think fat just, I got fatter and I'm still not flying as much as I need to. Um, but uh, the good I'll news is you can get program. away with that a little bit more swinging a golf club than you can trying to dunk. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. Even though the dunk, I'm not going to lie, not to brag on myself, but I got up to 220, 225 at one point in time and I was still able to dunk. Uh, so somehow, uh, despite just having like uh, almost a barbell or just a <laughs> weight vest, a weight vest of like fat and muscle on me, I still manage to get. I still can get up there. Um, but then we can. We'll use that picture as my before picture and after picture. And I'm sure once people see how jacked I get and my swing speed going up, they're going to be signing up for Fit for Golf 2.0. The last question I want to go into, and I think we'll dedicate some time. We've talked about doing a special series on things. I think this is one I think would be fun to dedicate an episode to on research, et cetera, but that would be hot, cold therapy. I've seen you tweeting more about it. That's something that's gotten more in vogue. And I've talked with buddies, both who play sports and who don't like, who aren't like actively playing sports. Like they play, they have a job and then in the morning they love their sauna and cold plunge or in the evenings they love their sauna or cold plunge or they go, finish up a XYZ and they hop in their cold plunge. Tell us, just give us a brief overview on what we know about at least, and I don't want to ruin anyone's, I don't want to ruin anyone's placebo effect. So if you don't want your placebo effect ruined, don't listen to the next part here. As far as what we know, actually the actual mechanisms that are going on and any like help or not help from sauna or cold therapy and when those things may produce be helpful for us. So like, for example, like if I go, am I about to go work out getting into cold plunge might not be good for me because I'm cooling down the muscle 
temperature. And there's probably limited circumstances that that would actually be a good thing for me. Whereas, not to spoil what I've at least understood, generally speaking, whereas if I've had a really intense workout and I'm about to have a, another one tomorrow, let's say I'm playing basketball or something like that, I might use, I might use, that might be a situation where cold therapy would actually be helpful for me because of the recovery. So tell, tell us about hot therapy, cold therapy, and anything like that and where we might actually experience benefits from that and where we wouldn't. I think the first disclaimer is that like, I'm not a PhD, you know, or have extensive experience with like research studies on hot versus cold, but obviously they've become extremely popular on social media from various, you know, fitness hackers or wellness kind of gurus or whatever title you want to give them. And I think the most important like question to go over first is if you hear people saying like, oh, they're so beneficial or they're so good for you or I love them, it's like, why are you doing them? Like, what are you hoping to get out of it is the first main question. Because if somebody says to me, I cold plunge every morning for five minutes and I absolutely love it, I feel great. That's fine. Like, absolutely great. If you think that's a way that you start your day and feel, you know, energized, positive, like, that's great. I have no issue with that. I think where we run into problems is when people try to claim benefits that are derived from either of them, and there is different benefits or not benefits to both of them. But that's one is like when people try and claim that they can do things that aren't really happening. And a second one actually is, like you said, are there times when it might actually be detrimental? I think most of those are slightly overblown. But then the third one that I think is arguably the biggest is what's the opportunity cost? Like if your goal is to improve at something like a fitness quality or health or general wellness, it's like if you spend, I don't know, an hour a week on this and your goal is X, could you have been spending that time doing something else that would be way more beneficial? And nearly every time... I dig into someone's questions about, well, how much time do you spend doing various forms of exercise versus how much time you spend in a cold plunge or in a sauna? I think almost always there would be more ben- or or how much do you sleep? I think almost or how much time do you spend food prepping or shopping for your groceries? I think almost always there's more benefit to be gained from those simple things. Like, If we go like cold first, and again, I'm not claiming to be the biggest expert here. From what I understand, I think the biggest thing it does, honestly, is obviously it's, it's a very, it's a very cold exposure to state the obvious. But I essentially think that that releases a rush of hormones that essentially wake you up. Like they make you very alert because holy shit, this is really cold. It's a, it's a huge stressor to the system. And as a result of that, people often feel really energized and very alert, which might be beneficial. That's great. The question about doing it after workouts, like the the summarized research on uh, cold water immersion after workouts isn't great for strength or hypertrophy. So basically what that means is if you're trying to get stronger or grow bigger muscles, it's probably not a great idea to jump into a cold plunge directly after a workout. So that's something to to watch out for. There's a difference. And like you brought it up, the, the reason why it probably isn't a great idea for strength and hypertrophy is almost the same reason why it might be helpful in certain scenarios when you're trying to increase recovery time, because it's essentially blunting the signaling processes for adaptation. So if you're playing, a, let's say you're playing an amateur tournament where it's 36 holes Saturday and Sunday, which I'm sure there's some events are. Getting in a cold plunge the Saturday night to try and help reduce inflammation and potentially not have as much muscle soreness the next day 
that might be a good time to fit it in because it's a time when you're really trying to optimize how quickly you recover, not how well you adapt to the training stimulus you've just had. So if I'm doing a random workout on a Wednesday and I'm pushing weights, I don't want to blunt the adaptation process. I don't care if there's inflammation or if I get sore because that's just part of the rebuilding process. But if I'm playing a, or if someone's playing a, you know, tournament on a Saturday and they're playing again on a Sunday and they're like, man, like I want to be as fresh as I can tomorrow. There may be some benefit to cold therapy in that scenario. But where I think people tend to go wrong is like, I don't think that it's as beneficial as making sure that you get your nutrition as good as you can and you make sure to get your sleep as good as you can. Like, not that it doesn't have benefit, but that's kind of where I'd be putting uh, the bigger focus. And I think the kind of biggest problem surrounding all of them is because they've become, like, I'm not anti any of them. And I'm, to be honest, I'm not well enough educated in them to give definitive answers. But where I think the kind of bigger issue lies, and this is probably health and training advice on social media in general, people just, they major in the minors. They, they focus on the small pebbles rather than the big rocks. And it's almost begotten fashionable to, to be talking about what your cold plunging protocol is. And it's like, you don't do enough exercise. <laughs> like you're you're spending 15 minutes a day doing X, like get your steps up. Do do 10 minutes of a mobility routine. Like do do something like that rather than passively being in, you know, cold water. Um the the research on like for health and longevity on saunas is way more robust than there is on on cold uh exposure but that doesn't mean i would tell anyone to not do either of them but like just be wary of why you're doing them and what benefits you actually think you're deriving from them and like in general whether it's general health performance or longevity none of them are as important as like lifestyle and i would like and by lifestyle i'm talking about like exercise slash training nutrition, sleep, like drugs, general life stress, those types of therapies can compete with making improvements there. And for most people that I've had experience working with, they don't, because they're busy, they don't put enough time into their exercise, nutrition, and sleep, and are almost hoping to, to get something back with these that they just don't have the capability to do, you know, like, and some of the, some of the protocols you see, see being recommended online are so time consuming. And I'm thinking like this person going for a 20 minute walk would be better than what this 45 minute or whatever, or 20 minute protocol is suggesting. Like, it's just, it's because it's fashionable and it's in vogue. Yeah. And I imagine people want to have feel things that are different than they, normally experience going for a walk is pretty not to use play on words but that's pretty pedestrian uh so it's fun to have a cold plunge and a sauna but that that is helpful as i said i think we'll have a whole special series dedicated to some of this stuff we appreciate you joining us remind people where they can find you on social media and where they can find fit for golf 2.0 and all that stuff yeah so social media is fit underscore four underscore golf and the best way to sign up for the app is to go to fitforgolf.app, especially if you're outside the US because uh, it's a little bit of a better rate signing up on the website than directly through the app store. They like to put some uh, fees on people when they're signing up. Perfect. Be sure to sign up for Fit for Golf. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, please subscribe, leave a rating, five stars preferably. But if you leave us one star, I'll accept it as long as it's a rating. If you're trying to find us on social media you can find us on instagram at the tournament code and on x slash twitter at tournament code as always we appreciate you joining us and look forward to diving deeper to what it takes to play elite tournament golf 